property. Okay. All right, thank you. It didn't work for me, but I'll try something else. All right. Hello, everybody. I see we got some people attending. Hi, Liz. You're still. Hi. All right, sorry about the late start. Uh, this was all technical, having some issues here. So uh, thank you. I see we're getting people coming on right now. We have 60 participants, and they're all coming in. So thanks a lot. Sorry for the delay. Um, recording. Yeah, a little bad mix up. I couldn't get on the Zoom today and probably some of you have had that problem already. All right. Well, welcome. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I did myself. Got to go deer hunting as some of you guys know and uh, had a great time. Successful on the hunt and um, it's definitely a great time. All right, well, we're here tonight to talk about uh, band-tailed pigeons. And Robert, you wanna take it away? Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name's Robert. I manage the hunter education program and basically I'm gonna keep track of questions that people have. Uh, so if you have a question uh, throughout the presentations, go ahead and use the chat function uh, just know that it's only those those chats are only going to be visible to us, the panelists, uh, and we'll try to answer questions as they come in. Um, if there's several people asking the same question at the end, we'll ask it so that everybody can get the get the answer uh, from the panel. Um, so tonight we're going to have three people on the panel: Lieutenant Alagi, uh, Alagi. He runs our Advanced Hunter Education Program. He does most of the work behind setting up these webinars. Let's see, he's been with the department for over 21 years. He grew up in Los Banos, avid duck hunter, um, dabbles in all hunting, um, except for bantail pigeon, right? I haven't done it yet. I'm, okay. I'm gonna do it this year. <laughs> You'd be dabbling. Um, and then we have Dr. Megan Crane, she's been with the department for about a year since January. She's an environmental scientist. Um, she did a dry run, a practice run of what she's gonna present tonight, the other day. And I guarantee everybody's gonna learn something because there's a lot of interesting little facts. And then Matt Gill, uh, Matt Gill's a warden. Uh, I didn't talk to him ahead of time. I don't know exactly where he's stationed right now. He can introduce himself when, when we get to that stage. So um, again, if you have questions, use the chat function. That's it. Thanks. Go ahead, Tom. All right. So Megan's going to start our presentation tonight, giving us a, a good background on what uh, band-tailed pigeons are. And then we'll have Matt come on and talk about hunting techniques and some other things that you'll want to consider when uh, pursuing band-tailed pigeons, and then uh, I'll make sure to cover some other opportunities that are will exist at the same time period, whether you're scouting or whether you're actually pursuing band-tailed pigeons out in the field. So go ahead, Megan, uh, introduce yourself a little bit more if you'd like, and start with your program. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Um, I'm Megan Crane. I'm originally from Florida, but I've been in California for the past 10 years or so now. Um, and I've been with the department, as you said, for about a year, working in the Migratory Upland Game Division with uh, upland game birds like band-tailed pigeons, uh, morning dove, and snipe. So I'm really excited to be on here tonight talking to you guys about band-tailed pigeons. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and get my presentation set up. Do this. And share. Ooh, not that one. Here we go. Can everyone see the slideshow now? Everyone sees that? Okay, good. All right, so bantail pigeons tonight. That's what we're talking about. Um, this is a bantail pigeon for those of you who haven't seen one before, if you're out there hunting for them. One of the most prominent characteristics of this species is its namesake, this bright white band that pops out when they're it's flying. You muted. can also see them. Oh, I'm, I'm muted. No, you're not yes. muted, but uh, we're, I'm seeing a slide of uh, poison oak. 
So oh, that's not right. Okay, how do I? Let's see. New share. Here we go. How's that? Let's see. Can you see a bird now? Not yet. Okay. I see. There we go. We're good. Excellent. So I'm not talking about poison oak just yet. <laughs> All right, so the, as I was saying, this is a band-tailed pigeon, and you see that bright white tail popping out when they're flying. Other field marks to pay attention to this, to for this species include uh, this white necklace on the back of their neck, and then this green iridescent scaling on the back of the neck. They also have a really bright and obvious yellow bill that has a black tip on it. They, this bright white band, as I mentioned, and these bright yellow feet. And they also have black wingtips, which pop out as they're flying too. Um, so the most, the band-tailed pigeon is, was closely related to the now extinct passenger pigeon. Both of these are uh, passenger pigeons, and this one on the right is the last living, last known living uh, passenger pigeon. They went extinct in the early 1900s, I believe. Uh, they shared a lot of characteristics. They had similar dietary preferences, eating fruits and nuts, including acorns, um, and they congregated in large numbers and were they're both migratory. So it's an interesting note that they were closely related to the species um, that is now extinct. But more extant species that they're related to or, or species that are still around include the Chilean pigeon and the ring-tailed pigeon. And you can see that the both of these species look a lot like the band-tailed pigeon, including that that banding on the bottom of the tail. And the Chilean pigeon even has that nice green scaling on the back of the neck. Um, so the name of the scientific name of the band-tailed pigeon is Patagionis fasciata. Um, Patagio means to clatter or loud and onas means pigeon. And then fasciata means banded. So it's literally the loud clattering banded bird pigeon. Um, and then there are two subspecies that occur in the United States, in uh, North America, including uh, P.F. manilis. Manilis means necklace, and then P.F. fasciata. So manilis is the, the subspecies that we would see here in California, and then fasciata is the interior species. And that's, you can see that a little bit better in this range map. On the left here along the coast, we have the, the manilis subspecies. And so this pink color is gonna be their summering or breeding range. And then the blue purple colors are the non-breeding or the all year round range depending on um, location. And so you can see that this interior or the, the interior species subspecies over here is geographically distinct from the interior subspecies. So there's not a, a gene flow happening between those. So they are distinct. And the interior population um, is actually declining more rapidly than our Western subspecies here in California. Um, so how do you find band pigeons? Where are they hanging out? Well, they have they cover a large uh, habitat range. And so they can appear in oak woodlands, the pine oak crossover areas, and they also occur in coniferous forest habitats. Um, they mostly feed on nuts and, and fruiting shrubs during the winter. So acorns, which are masting in about September, um, beginning in September, and then the fruiting shrubs that they rely on, which I'll go over a little bit more. Um, and then to find band-tailed pigeons, they often have lookouts at the tops of tall trees. So individuals will sit at the top to keep an eye out for hazards in the environment, predators and other dangers, um, and because they're social creatures that congregate in big groups. And so that's, this is what that looks like. You have these individuals, these sentries at the tops of the trees, um, just keeping an eye out for the safety of the group. So here is a nestling band-tailed pigeon, a face only a mother could love. Um, you see they, um, they nest and they, pr they produce about one, sometimes two eggs during their reproductive cycle. Um, and they can re-nest up to three times during season if conditions are right. Um, but they, during this stage, the parents are feeding their offspring crop milk. So they produce this secretion in the, their crop or their throat um, that's fatty and full of proteins and it feeds in this developing bird. Um, so it's, it's interesting that a bird is also producing kind of a milky secretion. And then this is a juvenile band-tailed pigeon. Um, you can see it looks very similar to an adult. The sear maybe isn't as bright and it also has this, these scaling on the edges of the feathers. You can see this kind of tinged uh, rusty color 
And this is characteristic of a lot of columbids, a lot of pigeon bird um, individuals. And so you see this also in morning dove. And so if you see any of these feathers on, a, on an individual, that means that they're a first year bird. They were born that year um, because they molt all of these feathers by their second year. Um, and then their diet consists, as I said, mostly of fruits and um, acorns. And so we have three different species that are really common here in California, and that includes the, the toyon, which is associated with oak woodland. Um, we have here the uh, madrone, the manzanitas, and um, coffee berry here. And so this makes up a really large proportion of their diet during the wintering months, especially uh, now as we go into the December, and later winter. Um, and acorns and other nuts make up a large proportion, usually in September, October, when the oak trees are massing. Um, and another kind of oak to look out for when you're out hunting these is the, the poison oak. Um, poison oak is uh, prevalent in the habitats where you might be trying to hunt fantail pigeons. Um, unfortunately, during the winter, it looks like this. So super obvious to differentiate this from every other plant in the environment when it doesn't have its leaves. Um, but be careful because it can produce a really nasty rash for people who are exposed to that or have a, a tendency to uh, react to poison oak really badly like I have in the past. And so as I said before, bantail pigeons congregate in groups. Um, they, they migrate in groups, they, they feed in groups during the winter. During the summer when they're breeding, they may be in the same area as other birds, but they, they're, not, they're not really territorial, but um, they are often around other birds. Uh, but they're very shy and wary of humans. So if you're moving through the forest, they're most likely going to fly away from you very fast if they see you. Um, and if they're flying away from you, they're a lot more maneuverable and a lot faster than one dove even. Um, they can turn on a dime, so that makes them really challenging to hunt. And then they're also really smart and have excellent vision. So it's almost impossible to sneak up on a vantilled pigeon. Um, you see here, this diagram shows a visual range of different species you have us over here, humans, a lot of binocular vision with a little bit of peripheral vision on the side. Um, an owl has a lot more monocular vision, but then a pigeon, the only way you're sneaking up on this guy is if you're directly behind it. Um, so they have, they're really good at detecting and avoiding predators. In addition to this wide range of vision, uh, band-tailed pigeons can also see into the ultraviolet range like other bird species. And so even though the birds to us may look like males and females are the same, they're going to be picking up on characteristics of plumage that may allow, allow them to differentiate males and females, as well as tell other, uh, other uh, quality indicators. So uh, a higher quality bird may have more iridescence that the birds are picking up on than uh, an individual who's maybe not doing so well that year. In addition to that, birds can also see polarized vision. So they can see the directionality of light, which is really important when they're migrating or moving through a landscape. They're able to orient themselves even when the sun isn't visible because they can see that the direction that light is moving. So really good vision, very acute vision for these birds. And in addition to that, if you're, you, you may think that you're camouflaged, but the reflectance on your clothing would, you may stand out like a, a sore thumb to a bantail pigeon in the environment. So it's something to take into consideration when you're uh, camouflaging yourself in the environment. Uh, another um, interesting fact, uh, most oftentimes people think of pigeons as being really dumb and just not very smart, but uh, that's not the case at all for, for pigeons, the Columbus uh, taxa. And there are a couple of instances of pigeons and their relationships with humans and just how intelligent and um, how, amazing, how <clears throat> amazingly athletic they can be. And so this is Winky. He was a, a soldier in World War I. Um, there was a Royal Air Force bomber that went down in the ocean and their last ditch effort at rescue was releasing Winky who flew 150 miles and alerted the the rescuers to the position of the down bomber. Um, they were able to triangulate based on wind speed and direction um, to exactly where the ship went down and sent out a rescue within 15 minutes of his arrival and everyone on the bomber survived. Um, this is Cher Ami. She was used in World War I. Um, there was a force of about 500 allied troops who were behind enemy lines on a secret mission so nobody knew that they were there. And they started to receive enemy fire as well as friendly fire. 
And so in an effort to get the message out that they were there, they sent out a pigeon and that pigeon was shot down. They sent out another pigeon and that pigeon was shot down. And then they sent out Sheremy, who was quickly shot down. Um, but she got back up and flew 25 miles in 25 minutes with uh, blinded in one eye, shot in the breast, and with her leg dangling by a thread, 25 miles in 25 minutes, and 200 of the horses were rescued because of her. And then as late as 1979, the U.S. Coast Guard was training pigeons to uh, find people who had been stranded at sea. And so they would put the birds in this little window at the bottom of an airplane and the birds were trained to peck at a screen. So anytime they saw somebody on the water, they alerted the crew to that, to that stranded person. And they, were, they had an 80%, around an 80% accuracy at finding people at sea, which is um, a lot higher than what a human would be able to see. So very acute vision, very intelligent and just amazing athletes. And these are all, instances of domesticated birds. And it's generally believed that wild animals are a lot more intelligent than domesticated uh, animals. So just imagine what you're up against out there in the woods, hunting down one of those band-tailed pigeons as compared to even the impre how impressive these domesticated individuals are. So where would you go out and find band-tailed pigeons in California? Well, uh, the map, these are the maps of where you would, where band-tailed pigeons occur. This map on the left is the breeding distribution of band-tailed pigeons. Um, so where they occur during the summer months and the bigger the triangle, the more individuals there are in that area. And this is based on breeding bird survey data. Um, on the right, you have where birds are wintering based on Christmas bird counts. So um, the bigger the circle, the more individuals are located there. And so you can see right off the bat that some of the some of these counties are going to have more individuals than others, and that includes Tulare, Alameda, um, Solano. Um, so those are those are areas to focus your efforts in trying to locate band-tailed pigeons. Um, and if you're also trying to plan your hunt, this is an interesting tool that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, has up online. You can find it at apps.wildlife.ca.gov. And what it does is it gives you areas in California that have um, wildlife areas or ecological reserves or public access areas. You can use this as a tool to plan your hunt and figure out where you're going to go to bag your limit this year. Um, so in December, the southern is opening up. We have already had the, the northern zone uh, hunting in uh, September. So December 19th through the 27th is the southern zone. Um, Time frame. There's a two bird bag limit, and the the, the possession is uh, triple that, so six birds that you can have in possession. So one of the questions that you might have is why is the bag limit so low? Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, for the past hundred years, populations have been um, declining. Uh, we in the past twenty years we've seen relatively stable numbers, which is good. Um, but some of the factors that led to a, a rapid decline in populations in the past included things like market hunting when thousands of birds would be shot at a time. Um, and this led to a really drastic decline in the population that actually led to conservation efforts to preserve this species. So Grinnell in the early 1900s recognized that this was an issue and market hunting was outlawed. Um, additionally, to hunting pressure, um, avian trichomoniasis has a huge impact on these populations. Um, so avian trichomoniasis is caused by a flagellated protozoan, which is a fancy way of saying a microbe with a tail. And this microbe causes these massive lesions in the mouth and throat of these birds that can prevent the birds from eating or drinking or even breathing if they get fat, if they get fat. And these outbreaks can, can kill uh, between um, 10, 000, 10, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of birds at a time. And so it, it can have really serious implications on the, the species. Um, so if you see a bird with avian trichomoniasis, um, make sure to report it to CDFW. And I have my contact information after this. Um, so if you, if you have any additional questions or concerns, feel free to reach out. And that's all I have. Thank you, Megan. Um... Really quick about that uh, that disease uh, is if if they were to report it, what would be the outcome of that? Like if what 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 would what would the department do upon 
No, um, well, we have a wildlife investigations laboratory and they keep track of outbreaks in the state and that helps us to monitor populations and how they're doing over time. And so having that information is really valuable because it can help us identify um, causes of outbreaks. And so potentially tracing back to contaminated water sources or if there's an issue in the human environment that's potentially causing these problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I was uh, researching something earlier. I don't mean, mean to spring this on you, but they're talking about mineral springs and how mm -hmm. valuable those are to uh, pigeons. Yes. So one of the surveys that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife does is the mineral site surveys. So during the uh, breeding season, uh, these birds are congregating at mineral sites, which contain large concentrations of sodium. Um, so these birds need that sodium in order to metabolize. They're, when their diet mostly consists of fruits, they're not getting a lot of the, the balance of minerals that they would need. Um, and so they seek out these sodium sources uh, to supplement their diet. And so that is a really important aspect or component of their survival. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, if you can, um, Matthew uh, Gill, Matt Gill, Lieutenant. Would you come on up, please? Thank you, Megan. Uh, we're going to answer some more questions at the end, but if you want to please st stand by, we'd appreciate it. Sure. All right. Thank you. Hey, Matt. How's it going, Sean? Hey, how's it going, Sean? All right. All right how you doing? So uh, I know you texted me and said, Megan covered it all, but uh, there's something there that uh, you're going to be able to help us with when it comes to people going out and pursuing um, our pigeons that are available here in California. So please tell yeah, us so, about, about where you're from and what experience you have and how you can help us become successful at pursuing pigeons. Uh, so my name is Matt Gill. I'm the Lieutenant Supervisor for San Luis Obispo and Monterey counties. Um, we have actually some resident pigeon populations here and have some very successful areas for pigeon hunting in these two counties. Um, so we, I've been hunting pigeons for several years, um, been pretty successful and contacted um, hundreds of successful pigeon hunters over the years and uh, been pretty good and pretty lucky so far. Um, some of the things that Dr. Crane brought up are great, uh, right on track. Um, some things about if you wanted to know where pigeons are, it starts with, uh, in my opinion, scouting. You need to be able to go out there earlier um, and try to find where the madrone berries are going to be, where the oak trees are going to be, and where what oak trees are typically producing right now. Um, some oak trees don't produce every year. There's sometimes the valley oaks that your green oaks that are um, evergreens, they are not producing every year. But sometimes at the higher elevations, you'll have tan oaks and the madrone berries that are producing. Um, if you don't do your scouting and your due diligence beforehand, you're not gonna know where the uh, birds are at. A lot of times I'll have birds fly in. Uh, they're pretty uh, migratory on weather. They're pretty weather dependent. So you might get an early storm push thousands of birds down possibly, and they might clean an area out of all the madrone berries and all the acorns pretty quick. And by the time you go up there on opening day, they're gone and they've moved. So one thing I would definitely explain and try to tell everybody is get out in the area if you have the opportunity. If you don't, try contacting a local officer or somebody in that area to see if you can you know, pick their brain about, hey, what's the acorns looking like down below in the valleys, the lower valleys and stuff like that. Um, what's the acorns looking like up top on the ridge tops? Uh, are there anything, uh, madrone berries? Are there any coffee berries? Where's the food source at? And they kind of also plan it off of, uh, of weather. I mean, if you have a cold front moving in, they're going to be moving. So that's something to really consider before you even getting out and getting out a shot off. You need to really do a lot of scouting. Um, so that's one thing I would tell everybody. And I have, I have dozens of people that call me every year that ask, hey, what, what's it looking like? Where's the, where's the food source and where's, where are they going to be at? How many have I seen? Have I seen early bands fly in already this year or not? So something to really consider is, hey, how far have they flown down? How many have already moved through? I've had years where we've had them fly in very early and then they leave and they keep moving further south. Um, we do have some resident um, birds here that stay all year round and never seem to leave, but that's pretty rare. That's uh, few. We have uh, mainly that they try to fly through. So that's one thing to really consider is before you get out in the field, just do your scouting, your due diligence, try to find out where the food sources are. Um, your live oaks typically seem to hold more pigeons than your tan oaks. For some, um, they're the evergreens. They seem to be able to conceal better in there. They like to hide better in there. 
Um, they seem to be like uh, Dr. Crane said, they're a lot smarter bird than a, a dove. So you're, uh, you got to up your game a little bit on that regards. Um, something else to consider is your camo. I mean, you're going to want to make sure you have camo out there. They are dove. You think, you know, pick up movement, pigeons pick up movement even better. Um, I've never contacted or myself been successful going up and be able to drive up and shoot a bird as out of the, you know, drive up and jump out really quick and try to go get it down. It's not going to happen. You've got to get out there before the break of dawn, before it's light out. That would go to scouting again, making sure you have an idea of where you want to go and find that oak tree, find that pine tree, find somewhere that you're going to be able to conceal yourself, but still get a good flight path. Um, typically they seem to fly across from hilltop to hilltop. So if you're in a valley, you might get them, but then again, you're shooting pretty high up. So you also have to look at a lot of times I'll have guys that are successful. They're on a ridge line. And so they're on a ridge line right along the brush, right underneath the pine tree, right in amongst the oaks tree. So they can't be seen as easily. And then you can uh, have a better opportunity that way. If you're out in the middle of a field, your, your chances are a lot less. Um, they're going to see you coming. And usually your shots that you're going to have are going to be skyscraping almost. They're going to be flying high because they see you. They fly a lot higher than a, a dove would fly. They have a lot um, higher altitude that they seem to be able to get to. So those are some things to definitely consider. Um, shot. Uh, I know with some people, um, it's not like hunting a dove or a quail where you can use seven and eight shot. Usually you're going to want to go down a little bit. Um, six shot worked pretty well for me, a pheasant load. Um, cause definitely cause they're flying and they're a little bit bigger of a bird. You're typically not going to be shooting that many pellets are going to be hitting them. Um, I know some guys, since the law for, has changed for lead where you can no longer use lead, it has to be steel. They've gone down to five shot and they feel five shots better for them that they're able to get out and reach further for them. Um, problem is finding five shot is a little harder, especially in steel. So, I mean, a six shot, I think is still doable. And I've had success with that all the way up to last year. I used it and was able to get limits of birds. So it is something you're going to want to have your choke selection. Um, it's going to be one more of a full choke. You want to be able to get out there. It's not something that's going to be super close to you. Typically there are birds that are going to be flying and they're flying fast. So you're going to have to shoot in front of them a little bit. I know when I contact guys in the field, when I'm not hunting, <clears throat> a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times they think these birds have bulletproof vests on because they're up there so high. They have, they're like, I can't do anything. I'm shooting at them everywhere. Well, a lot of times they have the wrong choke. So make sure you have the correct choke in your shotgun. Make sure you have the right shot. I've contacted guys with a modified choke and eight shot. And I'm like, well, you better go uh, try doing some quail hunting maybe instead. You might have better luck with that than pigeon hunting. Um, so it's definitely something to consider is check out your choke, check out your shotgun. And also, uh, I mean, uh, check out your, uh, your shot size and make sure you're using steel shot because you have to use steel shot for them. I know some people will still go out there and get confused about that. Um, so that's some of the things that I can think of right up, you know, going through that. Um, they typically, if you're not finding them, what I've noticed in the lower elevations in the valleys, um, usually these birds, they're bantail pigeons. They're not like your rock duck. They're not your city birds. They're in more rural areas. If you go out and find them in like the valley areas, then that's might be where they're congregated. Typically, I seem to find them better at higher elevations, usually something between a thousand feet at minimum starting and going up to several thousand feet. And you kind of find that, you know, that range of where they're uh, holding at. And we call it holding is where they're roosting at, where they're, where they're going to be. Um, usually your best time to shoot pigeons is getting up early in the morning and getting that morning hunt. There's been times I've been successful and contacted people that have shot until one o'clock in the afternoon. But unlike dove, where you get that late flight or they're trying to go to water, pigeons typically don't have that. I mean, you can have some, some rare days where you can shoot all day, but that's typically not true. Usually pigeons, once they start getting shot at in the morning, they tend to leave the area. They know they're smart enough to realize, hey, we don't want to be here anymore. We need to go somewhere else. And usually your hunts, uh, once the weather starts warming up, they kind of go roost and they kind of go elsewhere. They don't really fly too much. Usually they're a very early morning bird. They're not too much in the uh, afternoon area, uh, afternoon time. Um, and they're also not as water dependent as a dove. So like in a dove, you can go out there and sit in a vineyard and, you know, you'll go fly over. A lot of times with your uh, bantail pigeons, when they're flying and migratory and down, it's rain. There's water out there. There's resources for them to get to. And there's also in these mountain areas, there's natural springs, natural streams and stuff like the mineral springs that doc, uh, Dr. Crane was talking about. Um, they find that more than let's say a, a vineyard uh, watering area or some type of holding pond. So something else to consider that 
they don't necessarily rely on man-made structures and man-made stuff as much as you know, uh, dove might as well. So differently, a uh, different type of hunting situation than when you have from dove compared to pigeon. Pigeon is a lot, a lot tougher. There's a lot less birds. Um, if you get a good band flying in, you might limit out very quick if you're a good shot and be done. At other times, you'll have bands, uh, once they start in the morning, they'll be in larger bands and they usually break up into smaller bands because they've been shot at so many times. Um, also, if you shoot at them normally throughout the season, they get harder and harder to hit. Your opening day is usually the best. After that, they've gotten smarter. They see the movement they see you in the tree line and they know which trees that they've been shot at. They're like, okay, we don't want to go back and roost in that tree. We've had some issues there before. And so they are a pretty smart bird. Um, so those are some of the things that I would consider uh, when you're going out to hunt these, this type of bird out there. The other thing to consider is there's also usually typically quail, dove also open at this time of year when the southern half of the uh, pantail pigeon season opens. So if you're very successful and you get your two birds, you always have other, uh, bring your other equipment with you because you might get lucky on some other, other types of birds. Okay, thanks. thanks. Really quick, I want to launch a poll that I have. I know we have some questions that are coming in, but here's one I want uh, our thing to, our panel, not our panel, and our um, guest to uh, answer is, have you ever taken a band tail pigeon? Um, we have some people answering it right now, just to see what kind of crowd we have tonight. Um, really quick, Matt, uh, you mentioned how it's just mostly a, a morning thing. Um, what are some of the actual, uh, the problems you see when people are out there um, pigeon hunting, maybe enforcement wise that, that uh, need to be addressed? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Sean. So uh, every year we seem to have uh, quite a few early shooters. Um, surprisingly, people go out the day before to try to do that scouting, try to see stuff, and they'll try to shoot a Eurasian collar dove. A Eurasian collar dove is a lot larger bird than your uh, morning dove, and people mistake them like, oh yeah, we'll shoot the Eurasian collar dove, and they end up shooting pigeons. Um, it's pretty easy to tell by Dr. Crane once you shot one that it's okay, it's a bigger bird. It had yellow, bright yellow feet. Sometimes I've seen them orange, have shades of orange. The yellow beak gives them away. So that's something definitely, uh, definitely that we see. The lead laws that have all changed, you have to use steel. Um, your plug shotgun, some of these guys, when they're skyscraping, they're gonna wanna try to get that extra shot in, make sure your uh, shotgun only holds, is capable of holding three. So that's typically two in the magazine, one in the firing chamber. And if you have a side-by-side -side or an over-under. Um, then you're kind of exempt from that. And the other thing to remember is they are a, um, their color meat is like a, uh, like a dove. It's that dark red meat and it's a big uh, bird, but it can be easily confused with a Eurasian collar dove. So one thing you need to remember is to keep a fully feathered wing or head attached. That way it's readily identifiable. Um, a lot of times we call them naked birds in the field when we come across someone, they have a bunch of rested out birds. Um, there's no feathers on them. We have no way of identifying them especially with the limits and the populations as low as they are. We, um, something we take very seriously is making sure people aren't shooting that over limit of pigeons. And if you don't have that fully feathered wing or head attached, it very well could be that someone was trying to sneak them off as, hey, this is a Eurasian collar dove. And a juvenile um, uh, pigeon and a full-size Eurasian collar dove are very similar in size once you uh, breast them out and once you look at the meat color and everything. So that's something to consider. Um, this year, I know we already have problems with uh, people going into fire areas. So over here on the central coast, we have the Dolan Fire, which is closed down all of Monterey County for uh, the Los Padres National Forest. Over in the Fresno area, where I've hunted before for pigeons, uh, they have the Creek Fire, and that shut down quite a bit area. Uh, one thing to tell hunters is they need to check the public land that they're gonna go to if they're gonna go on public land, because a lot of it is closed due to fire safety and fire concerns. So make sure you know where you're going. Um, I know we've already contacted hunters out in the field before, not necessarily for pigeon, but for quail and dove for the second season of dove that have been in the forest that we've had to, you know, hey, tell them that it's closed. So make sure you know that because nothing worse than going out to the forest thinking you're great, you drove all that way and then having to be kicked out because it's a closed area, you're not being, or being denied entry because it's closed due to fire safety issues. So those are some of the larger issues we come across. It's just making sure you know where you're going. You're in an open area. Um, make sure you know what you're shooting at because that's a big thing. A lot of people get confused with the dove. We'll shoot both, uh, both dove and quail, at the, dove and pigeons at the same time. Um, and make sure you leave your bird 
uh, with a fully feathered wing or head attached. Don't try to make it completely uh, featherless and make sure your uh, plug is in your shotgun and you have steel ammunition. Really quick, uh, Matt, we've got this question come in a couple times. Are there any calls that you can use uh, for pigeon? I don't. So I've, there's never, I've never had any success with calls. I've never seen anybody actually use calls. As many times as I contacted people, I've never seen anybody use uh, calls for fantail pigeon. Any, or at least have any success with it that I've seen anybody. Quail, you have calls that you can make. Um, even Dove, they'll make some kind of cooing calls at some times. But pigeons, for the most part, they're not coming in. And even when you use like a dove, you can put out there uh, the mojo dove and things like that. Dove are different. They'll come to that type of uh, action when they see other dove on the ground that are eating, you know, dove weed and things like that. Pigeons aren't like that. They typically don't come on the ground too often. They're usually in the trees using that cover. The madrone berries is a, a perfect example. You can come up to a madrone tree that's got a bunch of berries in it and they're in that tree. They're not on the ground eating them. They're in that tree. And same um, with... Uh, you froze. All right. Well, we might have lost, lost Matt here, so I'll continue. Uh, our first poll, we have the results. I don't know if you saw them there, but 30% uh, have killed uh, a pigeon and 70% haven't. So really quick, let me show another, share another poll if we can. Stop sharing. And we'll go to number two. Is there another species which you may share the same habitat of pigeons that you may interest you more? Um, there's bear, wild pig, mountain quail, tree squirrel, wild turkey, and Christmas trees. What's that about? <clears throat> Go ahead and answer. Is there another species which may share the same habitat of pigeons that may interest you more? All right, we're getting a lot of people saying mountain quail and turkey. Oh, it's probably all going to even out. All right, mountain quail. High, high number of mountain quail and now wild turkey. All right. Yeah, the reason why we want to present this, we understand that the limit for pigeon is only two. But uh, you, if you go up into these areas where the pigeons are, you're also gonna have opportunities for these other species that are out there too. Just being prepared for them is gonna give you a chance to have another opportunity. So we're gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. The winner obviously was the mountain quail. Okay. A lot of people interested in mountain quail, the, the zones with mountain quail and pigeon will definitely overlap. And um, you can see that uh, Christmas trees, we had somebody answer Christmas trees. I have a little slide at the end of the presentation that I'll share why I put Christmas trees in there. All right. Somebody there talking, Matt, is that you? Yeah, so sorry about that. I ended up, my computer went down, so I had to switch to my phone. Yeah. Well, everything, I think you answered what we needed for that uh, section. I'm going to go ahead and proceed with my presentation. Uh, stand by, Matt, and we'll answer some more questions a little bit later. So let me share my screen. And last part of our presentation, you should see Beware of Poison Oak. Now, everybody knows what it looks like when it has uh, leaves on it, but this time of year, you're not going to see very much. <clears throat> but you will see these mass clumps at the bottom of oak trees and the rocky areas, uh, they can still affect you. So please do anything you can to avoid that. Uh, buy some Technu. Technu is a great cream that helps uh, remove that resin that may uh, get onto your body when it comes to um, rubbing up against it. You may have to uh, if you drop a bird in this type of stuff, uh, but anything you can to get yourself cleaned up would be great. All right, um, next slide. So when we talk about the regulations, um, we've already been presented with some of them, but please look them up on, online. We have most of them. Uh, not too many paper copies are being um, sent out these days. So they're all there online in our uh, DFW site. Talked about the bantail pigeons. This, Megan already covered this. The zones, the Northern zone is not open. It's already passed. 
but the Southern Zone opens the 19th uh, through the 27th. It's basically two weekends, uh, two per day. Possession limit is six. That means if you're staying up in the mountains for three consecutive days or even at home, uh, you can only have a max uh, possession limit of six. Okay. Tree squirrels, this will be another opportunity for you. Uh, areas overlap. You can see that the tree squirrel um, season is not open in Southern California or in Eastern, uh, east of the Sierras. Uh, be aware that you have to be in a trees, tree squirrel open hunting area in order to, to take them. Okay, the general season is open till January 31st. So even after pigeon season's open, if you found a place where there's tree squirrels, you have till January 31st in which to pursue them. Uh, wild turkeys, okay, if you're gonna go out and scout, that does the season does not overlap with uh, pigeons, but it will, uh, it is going now currently, and you have till December 13th in which to uh, uh, possibly take a wild turkey. <clears throat> During this fall season, you can take one a day, of either sex and have a, a two per season. So a couple weekends of scouting might also be fruitful in the way of maybe harvesting a wild turkey. We talk about the quail species that you may see. We will not see the gambles quail in most areas where pigeons are, but you will see valley quail and mountain quail. Um, the quail hunting zones are currently open all the way through January 31st in all the zones. So uh, works for the pigeon, uh, going out and pigeon scouting, possibly seeing some quail, okay. Um, got the mountain quail, it has a little curled uh, not, top notch on it, top knock, not sure what, how they say it. And then the, the female, it's more drab, a uh, little shorter. And you see both of them together. You can see the range map, basically it overlaps with the pigeon one that uh, Megan had showed us earlier. We have uh, overlapping ranges. Basically they're very rarely away from cover. So uh, some of the low Oakland areas, you're gonna be able to find them uh, in the rocks and, and brush and shrub. Uh, they always run a heavy cover for protection. Some of the areas where you have the oaks here, uh, it's the same as what uh, we'll, we'll be finding pigeons at. So this is your opportunity to harvest. Another quail habitat, ranges, ridge lines. I know we're looking for madrone berries, we're looking for coffee berries, all those areas. You have ridges like this, you might have uh, some, some flights of pigeons and uh, quail. Mountain quail, probably gonna be the most prevalent of the uh, shared, uh, um, habitat. Um, very, very, very often mountain quail will have lookouts. So they'll have somebody out there, a century quail that's out there trying to pay attention to what's, you know, hazards are out there. When it comes to male and female mountain quail, there's not really any distinguishable difference uh, in flight. You're gonna, you know, you'd have to be an expert basically to tell a difference between a male and a female. And you see again that their uh, range maps overlay, overlay with uh, pigeons. So you have an opportunity for mountain quail while you're out there pigeon hunting, pigeon scouting. Okay, habitat's kind of the same. We hope to, to see those species out there. Okay, um, white thorn or ceanothus, that's a common cover and uh, habitat of mountain quail. Um, you can get up early and listen for them. They're very vocal. They call to each other constantly. When I was on my deer hunt this last week, uh, the bowl area that I was sitting in, the mountain quail were calling back and forth to each other the whole time I was out hunting. Very neat. It's a sound that you can duplicate very easily too. So if you scatter some quail, you can maybe call them back towards you. Let, let, they would let you know where they're at by mimicking their call. Uh, bag limit is 10 per day, 30 in possession. Okay. Uh, all birds, as we've mentioned, uh, Matt said that they have to have a fully feathered wing or head attached um, until you get to your personal abode and uh, they're ready for consumption. 
hours of take, one half hour before sunrise to sunset. And make sure your shotgun is plugged, as Matt also mentioned, that you can, can't put more than two rounds into the magazine. Okay, somebody asked what kind of hunting licenses you need. You need a general hunting license. Also, you need to have a upland game bird stamp and also have the up, um, excuse me, the um, hip stamp filled out because bantail pigeons are migratory birds. Anytime you take migratory birds, you should have the harvest information study um, filled out. Talked about chokes and uh, steel sh shot uh, sizes. Make sure you use the appropriate for what you're taking. Uh, I know I put twos on here. I think of pigeons, possibly like small teal, maybe a little bit uh, smaller than uh, teal maybe, but um, you wanna make sure you get a good clean kill. You don't want a pigeon drifting off in the, from one ridge to another, that'd be very hard to retrieve. And they could probably easily do it if you don't uh, make a good clean kill. Uh, recommend gauges 12 and 20. Um, Chokes, improved cylinder and modified. Modified is basically equivalent to full choke when you're uh, talking about using steel shot. But make sure you don't have any shot size larger than BB. That would be a violation of the uh, um, fish and <clears throat> the Title 14, Section 311, which regulates what type of ammunition and method of take you can have. Other possibilities, really quick we have Black Bear. Okay, it's currently open uh, throughout the state there and these deer zones. Um, the current number of harvest at this time uh, as, of, as of 1125 was 803. And the season lasts until December 27th or until 1700 bears have been reported taken. So prior to bear hunting or pursuing a bear, you need to obtain a bear tag. Uh, you can only take one adult per season and you can't, it has to be over 50 pounds and no cubs and females accompanied by cubs may be taken. When we talk about method of take, you have to use at least a center fire rifle with expanding projectile, a muzzle loader with at least a minimum of 40 caliber. You can use a shotgun using slugs, no buckshot, but make sure all these rounds are non-toxic also. You can't use any uh, lead and also archery may be used. Um, wild pigs, okay, um, must be in possession of a tag prior to pursuing. So have a tag. Uh, you can take as many pigs as you have tags for. Uh, you know, don't take three tags and, I mean, three pigs and with one tag and then think you can go buy uh, two more tags after the fact. You really need to be in possession of those tags prior to take, okay. Method of takes are very similar to uh, bear, except they do have the addition of using a crossbow, okay? And Christmas trees, all right? You have limited time for this. Uh, if you're gonna go scouting, uh, if you obtain a uh, Christmas tree permit, the US Forest Service offices um, do sell these permits to give you a good reason to go out into the forest, look for your uh, pigeons, you have to obtain the permit by 12-4, uh, which is tomorrow, or no, two days from now. Uh, these are the forest services that are offering Christmas tree permits. So we have El Dorado, Humboldt, Toyab, Toyabi, Lake Tahoe, and Tahoe National Forest. Those are all areas, I, I believe, that are going to be open for pigeon hunting uh, during this winter, this late season. So gives you an excuse to go out there harvest a Christmas tree, look for some mountain quail, and maybe find some doves, I mean, uh, pigeons. So just some of the opportunities that you're prevent, presented with out there this year and to get you outside. That's what we're looking for, okay? And I'm back online. Robert, is there anything that uh, I missed while we're uh, out there? Several, several questions on this, and there's been some discussion back and forth between the panelists and whatnot, but are they good eating? Any suggestions on, on recipes, uh, stuff like that? All right, Matt, you wanna come on board, please? Um, so they taste a lot like a dove. So for those of you that um, hunt dove, 
dogs that are just they're larger dove they do have a lot gamier tastes i mean very dark red meat um so a lot of times i've uh when i've made them i've cut them into smaller chunks like a dove and made the jalapeno poppers which a lot of people make with their dove make dove jalapeno poppers um i've also baked them before I barbecued them a um, couple different ways. You're really never going to get that gamey taste out. So if you're really not into gaminess, you're probably not going to like pigeons maybe. Um, I did talk to one of my buddies today and he said he makes them into chicken Parmesan and he says he loves it. And he makes them into a chicken Parmesan and using uh, the pigeon breast instead. And they work great. Um, so I have them. I, if I cut them up and I put them into something that I enjoy, I really do like them. Um, you have to make sure it's something that you like. I've also put them in um, kind of like a chicken Alfredo type mix with some wine and they work really good. I know a lot of people use them as stew meat. Um, they'll put them in a stew. I mean, it's the cold, it's the winter time. You have a nice game meat there that you can put into a stew, like venison chunks and things of that nature. And you just have uh, pigeons instead. So they do eat, um, they are gamier bird. They're not like a uh, quail or it's going to be something like that, but they eat fine. There's no issues with them and you're getting a lot of meat. The bird you're shooting is a larger bird. So you're getting a good, decent amount of meat. And depending how you want to do it, I've seen people um, leave the head or the wing attached and they'll keep the legs and they'll keep um you know, keep those little bit of meat there too and get everything they can off of it. So it's something good. Yeah, the, the next one I kind of got isn't a question, but I wanted to take a moment to say thank you very much for all the hunter ed instructors that are tuning into this. I don't think we said anything about them at the beginning, um, but it looks, I mean, I don't recognize everybody's name, but it looks like we have people from up and down the state. Um, a good spread. So wanted to say thanks for staying engaged and uh, stick with it. We're going to get back to classes as soon as we can. So uh, back to the pigeons. Um, kind of a question of this might be for Megan or anybody. Uh, is it common for them to hang out with, you know, common doves, rock doves, park doves, stuff like, or pigeons, <laughs> park pigeons. Yeah. Do they intermix at all? Uh, the short answer to that is most likely no. Uh, they're sharing, they, re they wouldn't really share habitats. Uh, your common dove is going to be more in uh, urban areas, some suburban areas, but your uh, band-tailed pigeons are going to be more in wildlands. There has, has been a lot of movement into more suburban areas for band-tailed pigeons, but there's generally at um, higher elevations or areas where um, Common doves aren't as common. Probably another one for you, Megan. Um, I didn't get a chance to write down the outbreak that you were discussing, the disease yeah. outbreak. That the, somebody's asking, actually a couple people are asking, is there any danger to humans, any uh, overlap concerns that we should be aware of? So avian trichomoniasis is specific to birds. So if you have chickens, it can cause outbreaks in chickens, but there aren't any documented cases of it infecting humans um, or dogs or cats for that matter. There are trichomonas species that do infect humans, but the species that are specific to band-tailed pigeons are most likely not a threat to humans. Now, would I recommend eating those pustules that you find in the throats of those birds? Probably not. Um, but it, you're not likely to be infected by the protozoan. Deal. I only have one left, Sean, so if you got any. <laughs> no, no, I mean, we're doing fine. Uh, I think uh, both Matthew and uh, Megan's input tonight has been revealing of different information that uh, I didn't know some of it. So the biggest thing is just to get out there. We're looking for you guys, any barriers that you may have to going out and and pursuing pigeon or any of the other species that you uh, can incidentally uh, contact or encounter. That, that's what we want you to do is feel comfortable going out there and pursuing these species. Sean, got another question that I don't think we hit at the beginning of this one. Uh -huh. Are you gonna be sending links like you have in the past to, to everybody that's on here? Uh I have a few links. I didn't have too many links for this uh, topic, but I did do some research and, and found some stuff that was pretty uh, fascinating and can add um, to what we've talked about tonight. 
Uh, well, make sure that article. Make, so, make yeah. sure you add the uh, the link that uh, Megan used. I, I, I saved it, uh, but there's several people asking for the land viewer link. Okay. All right. Yeah, I will send that when I when I get out. Okay. Any other questions? Let me see. Uh, a lot of people want to learn about something down south, you know, what availabilities are down south. And, um, you know, that that's hard because, uh, unfortunately, southern people have to go through a long distance to get out to areas where you can hunt. And uh, but I know that they are prevalent down there. Uh, Santa Barbara County was one of the high counties um, that may not be as, you know, down south as you want. Um, but there are some people who are getting them down. Um, they're all over. It's hard to move up to hunt. All right. So anyways, uh, just get out there. As Matt said, try to find some people uh, within our department that can help you in that aspect of, hey, where am I encountering pigeons? And we can get you out there and get you out trying something. It's a short week of hunting, but uh, give it a try. I'm going to this year. Uh, really quick, Sean, I'll touch on it. The Los Padres National Forest covers all the way from Monterey County, Santa Barbara County, Ventura, and pretty much anywhere in the Los Padres National Forest, you're going to be able to find pigeons. So all the way down to Ventura, you just got to get in those mountain areas and they hold pigeons very well. So the Los Padres National Forest actually has the right climate. It has the right uh, berries. It has the right acorns. It has the right veg vegetation that uh, Dr. Crane was talking about, and it has all everything there. So that's typically a good area to go out and get um, pigeons in and find them. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we're reaching the seven o'clock hour. Um, there's some people that probably chatted in some questions that they didn't maybe get answered. I hope to answer them uh, personally. You can always email me to ask these questions. Uh, that's my job to answer them. And um, I will be sending out a link page. Um, so that uh, it can help you further expand your knowledge on pigeon hunting opportunities in California. And one, one last thing is this has been recorded and it will be posted uh, usually about a week or so after we're done. So if you or other people want to reference this, it, it will be available on the department yeah. website. All right. So thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Yep. And you've got the recording, Robert. I'll let you end it. I'll check out. Good night, everybody. <laughs>